today we welcome Dr. Andrew Dowes, professor of botany here at OSU, and he's going to help us look at some of the plants' adaptations to water stress. Well, welcome to the show, Andrew. Oh, thank you, Kim. I know when we think of water stress, the, the desert comes to mind, and certainly there's a lot of examples of how plants cope from that Yeah, the desert's a, a great place to start thinking about how plants adapt to water or mm -hmm. water stress. Take this cactus, for example. So when we look at a cactus, you know, firstly we don't see any leaves, do we? No, and what no we spines. Yeah, <laughs> so the so the photosynthetic tissue of a cactus is, is the is the stem itself. And you'll notice also that these stems are pleated or ribbed, yeah, just like an accordion. Mm -hmm. So what the cactus does it has a very shallow root system. It collects any rain that comes and it brings it into the stem, and that accordion actually, exp like, sorry, that stem expands like an accordion. So it can actually hold more water as it collects that water. Now, no leaves, but what do the leaves become? Spines. The leaves Protection. have become, exactly. <laughs> if you have a whole, huge amount of water in the desert, you've got to protect it. That's really important. So these cacti, I see as an example of an endurance strategy. Mm -hmm. They collect their water, they keep it. They actually have some other strategies for minimizing water loss. There's a thick, waxy layer on the yeah. outside of the mm -hmm. stem. Uh, also, the the way that the plant makes sugars is actually adapted to this desert they life as well. They have a special photosynthesis they called do. CAM, right? CAM photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. See, most plants, they bring in carbon dioxide during the day and make sugars during the day, because that's when there's light. Right. Okay. These don't. What they do is that they make sugars during the day, of course, but they actually bring in the carbon dioxide to make those sugars at night. Mm -hmm. So they open themselves up to bringing in gas and also losing water, but only at night when right. it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, not so stressful. It's a little so, cooler. It's a little cooler, it's often a lot cooler <laughs> in the desert, yeah, so you that's just don't true. lose as much water. Mm -hmm. So that CAM mechanism, cacti have it, but also things like uh, pineapples have it, agave has it. Mm -hmm. A number of different plants use this strategy uh, to, to really minimize water loss. Well, Andrew, I, I like the way you described to me earlier that plants kind of have three different strategies to deal with water stress and like the cactus just endures through it. Tell me about some of the other mechanisms. All right, mm -hmm. so I guess another way would be to just evade water stress. In other words, you're in a desert, but let's not experience the desert by putting a taproot so far down that we actually hit water. Mm -hmm. Something like mesquite has that, uh, has that response. In, and also, what Yeah, do you in the garden we have the lead plant, which is, it's coming from a, a different habitat from the grassland, but the same idea, send that taproot down as deep as possible. Absolutely. So that's two of the strategies, mm -hmm. that that is uh, enduring and evading. Of course, the other thing you can do is simply escape from drought altogether. Mm -hmm. So when a rain comes, however infrequently it might be, when the rain comes, the plant immediately germinates and starts growing and has to get to reproductive maturity and produce seeds while there's still water there. Mm -hmm. And many of our desert annuals just do that. Right. And so they have a life cycle really speeded up in order to basically escape from the predominant condition of drought. It's interesting because we have, an, again, another example from a garden setting with the rain lilies where after the rain they'll put up their flowers and produce seeds. So. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. And actually there, there are ones that either just go a full cycle with just using seeds or they have a perinating tuber or something like that mm -hmm. and only produce an above ground organ when there's rain and then that goes down goes again. Goes back to dormant. So yeah, mm -hmm. so there are kind of multiple strategies that plants use to escape extreme drought conditions. But it's also true that all plants have to control their water. Right. Mm -hmm. So all plants are covered by a waxy cuticle which stops, doesn't stop, it uh, kind of slows, slows down, down yeah. water loss. Mm -hmm. And different plants that are hardier actually have more of that cuticle than plants that are not so hardy. Of course, you can't just have an impervious sheet around your plant. Those, they, they have to have holes to let gas in and right. water out. Mm -hmm. Those holes those stomates are controlled by the plant, so that when the plant starts to feel stress, and it feels stress first in the roots, it sends a hormonal signal, uh, mm -hmm. abscisic acid, gets floods through the plants and, and triggers those stomates to close shut. Close down. So mm -hmm. the natural response of a plant under stress is to close down. Close down. We've seen that quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this summer's been an excellent summer for watching drought stress. And there's a number of um, different morphological adaptations, kind of similar, but yeah, we should go through some others. of those. Let's take a look. Let me first start with the cactus. Oh, okay. So we talked about this fluted shape being very good for storing water, yes. but it's actually very good for heat transfer as well. Okay. You have to think about it. Most, if you're a deciduous tree, for example, you try and put your leaf 
perpendicular to the sun's rays mm -hmm. and the heat because you want to get as much of that as possible. That's not what a cactus wants. A cactus wants really to get as least of that heat and, and light as possible. So it doesn't have leaves and even the stems have this fluted shape and that allows conduction or easy convection of heat up those flutes. It to escape. Now we see another adaptation to kind of reducing heat and that's with um, that light coloring on the surface. Andrew, I know you mentioned the hairs on this cacti are another great adaptation. Yeah, so what, what happens with these hairs, notice their color. They're kind of this very silvery white color. That is excellent for reflecting sunlight and heat. It's, mm -hmm. we, we call it, it's a, it's a high albedo uh, of high reflectance. Mm -hmm. So not, a, not only that, it also traps these 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 hairs can actually trap moisture as well mm -hmm. from dew or something like that. Yeah, so, I pulled some of the stachys oh, yes, leaves, the lamb's ear, an and you can see the moisture trapped in there. And this would be this is morning dew. Yeah, this right. is from the yeah. morning dew. This is an so. excellent example. Many many plants has this adaptation to just take any of the water sources they can find, trap it. It runs. What what will happen is those drops will run down the flutes here, oh, and yes. they'll be collected by the root system underneath. Excellent. So now another er way we get that light coloration on the leaf is with the waxy coatings. Those kind right. of bluish. Right. So, so I guess even more plants have mm -hmm. waxes or bluish gray waxes, bluish greeny waxes, mm -hmm. which also do that uh, reflection. A lot of particularly like Mediterranean herbs herbs will see that in, right. in the lavenders and rosemaries and things like that. And I think we've got a great example with the dahlia. dahlia. Andrew, the dahlia really demonstrates that light reflectiveness of the foliage. Yeah, it's a, it, and in this case it's waxes, not mm -hmm. the hairs that are doing it. And you can feel that wax if you, if yeah, you push you this finger and, and, and thumb. Mm -hmm. uh, also when you water it, water tends to form these Distinct, discrete drops, you know, like like when you water uh, like a cabbage or something like that. Mm -hmm. That also has this very thick wax on it. Yeah, and the water will bowl up Ex on there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, the leaves are also fairly small on here. Well, I would, would have said they were very small. But <laughs> <laughs> and that's another adaptation for reducing surface area to volume ratio. Mm -hmm. Does another that reduce evaporation? It reduces evaporation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You have less surface area for the same amount of wet material inside. Because you have to remember, a plant inside is wet. It's at 100% humidity, or mm -hmm. it's water itself. So it's that interface that really has to protect between its wet interior and what might be extremely dry exterior. Exactly. But even today where we're sweating because there's humidity around, mm -hmm. uh, it's still much drier in the air than it is in the plant. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the leaves have another adaptation to retain moisture and that's kind of the position of the leaf on the plant. Right. I mean, you can't see it so easily in these, but uh, there are many plants that live in uh, high light, dry environments which hang their leaves like, like this rather than being perpendicular to the light. And that is again like the cactus stem for convective heat loss and also minimizes some of the heat and light that's hitting it. You know, I come from Australia and they're the, the predominant tree is eucalyptus and that always hangs its leaves down because Australia is kind of a hot place. Here we have the compass plant and they're vertical but, but they're also moving that's, to minimize That's even light. cooler. That's mm -hmm. even cooler. <laughs> okay, the other thing we want to see though is perhaps environments or plants that are, are adapted to environments where we don't usually think of water stress. So pine trees are an example of a plant that we might not think so much about water stress. But in fact, although some trees, of course, like pine trees grow on rocky ledges, a lot of them grow in like snow-covered forests, and mm -hmm. we just don't think of that as being a particularly water stressed environment. But of course it is. Yeah, when all the water's held up in snow or frozen exactly. in the ground. Exactly. It's not accessible to the plant. Mm -hmm. So the plant has to have adaptations to keep the water it has and to try and pull water as it can out of the, out of the soil. What, what pine trees in those sort of environments do is they basically shut down for the winter. Right. So they're not mm -hmm. They're not doing active photosynthesis. There's not much light around. So mm -hmm. they don't have much need for water, but they still need to survive. So they keep the water they have. Right. And you'll see that these pine needles are very, well, they're, they're sort of almost circular in cross section. Again, uh, a small surface area to volume ratio. They're needly, and that means that it's actually very, they have a small boundary layer, which means that heat efficiently uh, leaves them or goes okay. through them, mm -hmm. unlike a broad flat surface. Mm -hmm. And also they have very few holes in them, very few stomates to let, okay. let, let air. And those stomates are actually in, in channels, so they're actually quite hard for the water mm -hmm. to get out. 
Uh, and yeah, so they have a number of other adaptations internally in order to control water loss from the central core of the, the conducting uh, vessels. So even here, you know, these plants live in stressed environments we're just not used to yeah, thinking of as stressed. Yeah, we don't think of it that way. Mm -hmm. Another might be um, maybe a salty habitat. Oh yeah, like mm -hmm. mangroves for example. Mangroves have live in the water. There's yeah. no problem about water. Water's everywhere except it's salt water. Right. And plants can't use salt water. They have to do, well what mangroves do is they try and exclude it at the roots mm -hmm. or they excrete it from, the, from salt glands mm -hmm. on the leaves. So they just try and get rid of it some way or other. We probably have examples here of another response which would be to have a succulent leaf and to fill that with salt and then they right. fall off when they get too right. salty. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. amazing just the wide variety of adaptations that plants have evolved to deal with these different situations. But it's not surprising, is it? I no, mean, no. plants are rooted. They mm -hmm. just have to take whatever comes to them. Mm -hmm. It's not like us. I mean, you know, it's actually rather nice being here under the shade, mm -hmm. but these plants have no option. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think from a gardening standpoint, we have a lot of uh, visual cues to look for when we're selecting plants and mm -hmm. trying That's to right. find Morphology, something. Morphology, waxes, yeah. hairs, etc. Uh, and also when you put it in the garden, if it dies, that's another one. So. <laughs> There's some optimism for us. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing today. Uh, it was a real pleasure. Thank you, Kim.